Hello and welcome to another episode of Unworthy History. Today we got some more actual history for you from this book right here, Indian Depredations in Texas by J.W. Wilbarger. This book was published all the way back in 1889. Now today's story is episode 7 of the series I'm doing on the Parker Family Massacre in 1836 and the subsequent battles that took place over 20 years later. So this episode today is about General Lawrence Sullivan Ross and the Battle of the Wichita. Lawrence Sullivan Ross was born in the village of Bentonsport, Ohio in the year 1838. His father, Captain S.P. Ross, immigrated to Texas in 1839, casting his fortunes with the struggling pioneers who were blazing the pathway of civilization into the wilds of a terra incognita, as Texas then was. Captain S.P. Ross was for many years preeminent as leader against the implacable Indians, who made frequent incursions into the settlements. The duty of repelling these forays usually devolved upon Captain Ross and his neighbors, and for many years his company constituted the only bulwark of safety between the feeble colonists and the scalping knife. The rapacity and treachery of his Comanche and Kiowa foes demanded of Captain Ross sleepless vigilance, acute sagacity, and a will that brooked no obstacle or danger. It was in the performance of this arduous duty that he slew in single combat Bigfoot, a Comanche chief of great prowess, and who was for many years the scourge of the early Texas frontier. This is of course distinct from Bigfoot Wallace. The services of Captain S.P. Ross are still held in grateful remembrance by the descendants of his compatriots, and his memory will never be suffered to pass away while Texans feel a pride in the sterling worth of Texas's greatness and glory. The following incident, as illustrative of the character and spirit of the man and the times, is given. On one occasion, Captain Ross, who had been visiting a neighbor, was returning home afoot, accompanied by his little son, Sol, as the general was called. When within half a mile of his house, he was surrounded by 15 or 20 mounted Comanche warriors, who commenced an immediate attack. The captain, athletic and swift of foot, threw his son on his back and outran their ponies to the house, escaping unhurt amid a perfect shower of arrows. Such were among the daily experiences of the child, and with such impressions stamped upon that infantile mind, it was but natural that the enthusiastic spirit of the ardent youth should lead him to such adventures upon the warpath, similar to those that had signalized his honored father's prowess upon so many occasions. Hence we find Sol Ross in 1858, during vacation from his studies at Wesleyan University in Florence, Alabama, though a beardless boy scarcely twenty years of age, in command of a contingent of 135 friendly Indians, cooperating with the United States Cavalry under the dashing Major Earl Van Dorn in a campaign against the Comanches. Notwithstanding the severe chastisement that had been inflicted on the Comanches at Antelope Hills, they soon renewed their hostilities, committing many depredations and murders during the summer of 1858. Early in September, Major Van Dorn received orders from General Twiggs to equip four companies, including Ross's Indian warriors, to go on a scouting expedition against the hostile Indians. This he did, penetrating the heart of the Indian country, where he proceeded to build a stockade, placing within it all the pack mules, extra horses, and supplies, which were left in charge of the infantry. Ross's faithful Indian scouts soon reported the discovery of a large Comanche village near the Wichita Mountains about 90 miles away. The four companies, attended by the spies, immediately set out for the village, and after a fatiguing march of 36 hours, causing the men to be continuously in the saddle the latter 16 hours of the ride, they arrived in the immediate vicinity of the Indian camp just at daylight on the morning of October 1st. A reconnaissance showed that the wily Comanches were not apprehensive of an attack and were sleeping in fancied security. The horses of the tribe, which consisted of a cabalata of about 500 head, were gazing near the outskirts of the village. 
Major Van Dorn directed Captain Ross at the head of his Indians to round up the horses and drive them from the camp, which was effected speedily, and thus the Comanches were forced to fight on foot, a proceeding extremely harrowing to the proud warrior's feelings. Just as the sun was peeping above the eastern horizon, says Victor M. Rose, whose graphic narrative we again quote, Van Dorn charged the upper end of the village, while Ross's command, in conjunction with a detachment of United States cavalry, charged the lower. The village was strung out along the banks of a branch for several hundred yards. The morning was very foggy, and after a few moments of firing, the smoke and fog became so dense that objects at but a short distance could be distinguished only with great difficulty. The Comanches fought with absolute desperation, and contended for every advantage, as their women and children and all their possessions were in peril. A few moments after the engagement became general, Ross discovered a number of Comanches running down to the branch, about 150 yards from the village, and concluded that they were beating a retreat. Immediately, Ross, Lieutenant Van Camp of the United States Army, Alexander, a regular soldier, and one Caddo Indian of Ross's command, ran to the point with the intention of intercepting them. Arriving, it was discovered that the fugitives were women and children. In a moment, another group of women and children came running immediately past the squad of Ross, who, discovering a little white girl among the number, made his Caddo Indian grab her as she was passing. The little white girl, apparently just about eight years of age, was badly frightened at finding herself a captain to a strange Indian and stranger white men and it was hard to manage her at first. Ross now discovered through the fog and smoke of the battle that a band of some 25 Comanche warriors had cut his small party off from communication with Van Dorn and were bearing immediately down upon them. They shot Lieutenant Van Camp through the heart, killing him before he could fire his double-barreled shotgun. Alexander, the United States cavalryman, was likewise shot down before he could fire his gun, which was a rifle. Ross was armed with a sharps rifle and attempted to fire upon the exultant Indians, but the cap snapped. Mohi, a Comanche warrior, seized Alexander's rifle and shot Ross down. The indomitable young ranger fell upon the side on which his pistol was borne, and though partially paralyzed by the shot, he turned himself and was getting his pistol out when Mohi drew his butcher knife and started towards his prostrate foe some fifteen feet away with the evident design of stabbing and scalping him. He made but a few steps, however, when one of his companions cried out something in the Comanche tongue, which was a signal to the band, and they broke away in confusion. Mohi ran about twenty steps when a wire cartridge containing nine buckshot fired from a gun in the hands of Lieutenant James Majors, afterwards a Confederate general, struck him between the shoulders, and he fell forward on his face, dead. Mohi was an old acquaintance of Ross, the latter having seen him frequently at his father's post on the frontier, and recognized him as soon as their eyes met. The faithful Caddo Indian held on to the little girl throughout this desperate melee, and strange to relate, neither were harmed. The Caddo doubtless owed his escape to the fact that the Comanches were fearful of wounding or killing the little girl. This whole scene transpired in but a few minutes and Captain N.G. Evans' company of the 2nd United States Cavalry had taken possession of the lower end of the Comanche village, and Major Van Dorn held the upper end, and the Comanches ran into the hills and brush. This was not, however, before an infuriated Comanche shot the gallant Van Dorn with an arrow. Van Dorn fell, and it was supposed that he was mortally wounded. In consequence of their wounds, the two chieftains, Van Dorn and Ross, were compelled to remain on the battleground for five or six days. After the expiration of this time, Ross's Indians made a litter after their fashion, borne between two gentle mules, and in it placed their heroic and beloved boy captain, and set out for the settlements at Fort Belknap. When this mode of conveyance would become too painful for Ross by reason of the rough, broken nature of the country, these brave caddos, whose race and history are but synonyms of courage and fidelity, would vie with each other in bearing the burden upon their own shoulders. At Camp Radzeminski, occupied by the United States forces, 
an ambulance was obtained, and the remainder of the journey made with comparative comfort. Major Van Dorn was also conveyed to Camp Radzeminski. He speedily recovered of his wound, and soon he made another brilliant campaign against the Comanches, as we shall see further on. Ross recovered sufficiently in a few weeks, so as to be able to return to college at Florence, Alabama, where he completed his studies and graduated in 1859. This was known as the Battle of the Wichita Mountains, a hotly contested and most desperate hand-to-hand -hand fight in which the two gallant and dashing young officers, Ross and Van Dorn, were severely wounded. The loss of the Whites was five and several wounded. The loss of the Comanches was 80 or 90 warriors killed, many wounded and several captured, besides losing all their horses, camp equipage, supplies, etc. The return of this victorious little army was hailed with enthusiastic rejoicing and congratulation, and the Wichita fight, Van Dorn and Ross, were the themes of song and story for many years along the borders, and in the halls and banqueting rooms of the cities, and the martial music of the Wichita March resounded through the plains of Texas, wherever the Second Cavalry encamped or rode off on scouts in after years. The little girl captive, of whose parentage or history nothing could be ascertained, though strenuous efforts were made, was christened Lizzie Ross, in honor of Miss Lizzie Tinsley, daughter of Dr. D.R. Tinsley of Waco, to whom Ross at that time was engaged, and afterwards married in May of 1861. Of Lizzie Ross, it can be said that in her career is afforded a thorough verification of Lord Byron's saying, truth is stranger than fiction. She was adopted by Captain Ross, properly reared and educated, and became a beautiful and accomplished woman, finally redeemed from a captivity worse than death by a knight entitled to rank for all time in the history of Texas, primus inter pores. Lizzie Ross accompanied General Ross's mother on a visit to the state of California a few years since these events, and while there became the wife of a wealthy merchant near Los Angeles, where she now resides. Such is the romantic story of Lizzie Ross, a story that derives additional interest because of the fact of its absolute truth in all respects. So that's the end of this episode. This was about Lawrence Sullivan Ross and the Battle of the Wichita Mountains. So this is episode 7 in my series on the Parker family massacre that occurred in 1836, where Cynthia Ann Parker was kidnapped as a child. And here we heard about this other Comanche captive, Lizzie Ross, whose family they were able to find nothing about, and she was adopted by Captain Sullivan Ross. So you can check out more of the episodes from this series on this playlist on the Parker family of Texas. And in the next episode of this series, we'll talk about the Battle of Pease River. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.